Hello, today we'll be going through practice questions 1 to 10 for the CompTIA Security Plus exam. Let's begin. Which of the following threat actors is the most likely to be hired by a foreign government to attack critical systems located in other countries? The correct answer is C. Organized crime. Organized crime groups are the most likely to be hired by foreign governments to attack critical systems in other countries. These groups often have the resources, technical skills, and operational structures needed for such complex tasks, and governments may use them to maintain plausible deniability during cyber operations. Why the other options are incorrect? A. Hacktivist. Hacktivists act based on ideology, not for money or government contracts. They are typically independent and not under foreign government control. B. Whistleblower. Whistleblowers reveal internal secrets rather than launch attacks. Their intent is usually to expose wrongdoing, not disrupt systems. D. Unskilled attacker. Unskilled attackers or script kiddies lack the technical capability to carry out sophisticated attacks on critical infrastructure. Therefore, the correct answer is C. Which of the following is used to add extra complexity before using a one-way data transformation algorithm? The correct answer is D. Salting. Salting is the process of adding random data to input before it is passed through a one-way transformation function like a hash. This ensures that even if two users have the same password, their resulting hashes will be different making pre-computed attacks like rainbow tables ineffective. Why the other options are incorrect? A. Key stretching. Key stretching strengthens weak keys by repeatedly adding a cryptographic function, but it does not add randomness before the hash like salting does. B. Data masking. Data masking hides real data by substituting it with fictitious but realistic values, often for testing or privacy purposes. It is not part of cryptographic transformation. C. Steganography. Steganography conceals data within other media, not by altering or securing the data through hashing or encryption. Therefore, the correct answer is D. An employee clicked a link in an email from a payment website that asked the employee to update contact information. The employee entered the login information but received a page not found error message. Which of the following types of social engineering attacks occurred? The correct answer is D. Phishing This scenario is a classic phishing attack. The attacker tricked the employee into clicking a malicious link and entering login credentials on a fake website. The goal was to steal sensitive information by impersonating a legitimate payment site, a hallmark of phishing. Why the other options are incorrect? A. Brand impersonation. While the fake site may have used branding to appear legitimate, brand impersonation is a tactic within phishing, not a standalone type of social engineering attack. B. Pretexting. Pretexting involves creating a fabricated scenario to trick someone into revealing information. In this case, there was no backstory or human interaction, just a deceptive email and link. C. Typo squatting. Typo squatting relies on users accidentally visiting misspelled domain names. In this case, the user was directed through a crafted phishing email, not a typo in a URL. Therefore, the correct answer is D. A data administrator is configuring authentication for a SaaS application and would like to reduce the number of credentials employees need to maintain. The company prefers to use domain credentials to access new SaaS applications. Which of the following methods would allow this functionality? The correct answer is A. SSO. SSO allows users to log in once using their domain credentials and access multiple applications, including SaaS services, without needing to manage separate usernames and passwords. This reduces credential sprawl and improves the user experience while maintaining centralized control. Why the other options are incorrect? B. Leap. Leap is a deprecated wireless authentication protocol developed by Cisco. 
is not related to SAS login or domain-based authentication. C. MFA. MFA enhances security by requiring multiple forms of verification but does not reduce the number of credentials a user manages. D. PEAP. PEAP is used to secure communication over wireless networks, not to simplify SAS login or credential management. Therefore, the correct answer is A. Which of the following scenarios describes a possible business email compromise attack? The correct answer is A. An employee receives a gift card request in an email that has an executive's name in the display field of the email. This is a classic example of a BEC attack. BEC typically involves impersonating high-level executives or other trusted individuals to manipulate employees into performing actions like buying gift cards or transferring funds. The use of a familiar display name adds to the deception, even if the email address itself is fraudulent. Why the other options are incorrect? B. Employees who open an email attachment receive messages demanding payment in order to access files. This describes ransomware, not BEC. The goal here is extortion through file encryption, not social engineering via impersonation. C. A service desk employee receives an email from the HR director asking for login credentials to a cloud administrator account. While suspicious, this leans more toward credential phishing. BEC typically involves financial fraud or manipulation of business processes, not necessarily credential harvesting. D. An employee receives an email with a link to a phishing site that is designed to look like the company's email portal. This is a general phishing attack, not a BEC. BEC usually involves spear phishing with targeted, high-level impersonation aimed at financial or sensitive business actions. Therefore, the correct answer is A. A company prevented direct access from the database administrator's workstations to the network segment that contains database servers. Which of the following should a database administrator use to access the database servers? The correct answer is A. Jump server. A jump server acts as an intermediate system that administrators can securely connect to before accessing critical resources such as database servers. By isolating direct access, the company adds a layer of security and control while still allowing administrative functions through the jump server. Why the other options are incorrect? B. Radius. Radius is used for centralized authentication, authorization, and accounting. It does not provide access to network segments or act as a bridge between systems. C. HSM. A HSM is a dedicated device used to manage and protect cryptographic keys. It has no role in facilitating access to database servers. D. Load Balancer. A load balancer distributes incoming traffic across multiple servers to optimize performance and availability. It does not provide administrative access to database systems. Therefore, the correct answer is A. An organization's internet-facing website was compromised when an attacker exploited a buffer overflow. Which of the following should the organization deploy to best protect against similar attacks in the future? The correct answer is B. WAF. A web application firewall is specifically designed to protect web applications by filtering and monitoring HTTP traffic. It can detect and block common attack patterns such as buffer overflows, SQL injection, and cross-site scripting, making it an effective defense against web-based exploitation. Why the other options are incorrect? A. NGFW. A next-generation firewall provides deep packet inspection and may block some threats, but it is more focused on network-level threats than application-layer attacks like buffer overflows. C. TLS TLS encrypts data and traffic to ensure confidentiality and integrity but does not protect against application-layer exploits such as buffer overflows. D. SD-WAN 
Software Defined Wide Area Network is a network architecture solution for optimizing and managing WANs. It does not offer protection against web application attacks. Therefore, the correct answer is B. An administrator notices that several users are logging in from suspicious IP addresses. After speaking with the users, the administrator determines that the employees were not logging in from those IP addresses and resets the affected user's passwords. Which of the following should the administrator implement to prevent this type of attack from succeeding in the future? The correct answer is A. Multi-factor authentication. MFA adds an extra layer of security by requiring users to provide additional verification beyond just a password. Even if an attacker obtains a user's password, they would still be blocked without the second factor, effectively preventing unauthorized logins from suspicious IPs. Why the other options are incorrect? B. Permissions assignment. While important for limiting what users can access, it doesn't prevent unauthorized logins. It controls what a user can do, not who is logging in. C. Access management. This is a broad term encompassing identity and permissions management. However, it doesn't specifically address the need for stronger user authentication like MFA does. D. Password complexity. Complex passwords make brute force attacks more difficult, but if credentials are stolen through phishing or malware, complexity alone won't stop unauthorized access. Therefore, the correct answer is A. A company is required to use certified hardware when building networks. Which of the following best addresses the risks associated with procuring counterfeit hardware? The correct answer is A. A thorough analysis of the supply chain. Conducting a thorough supply chain analysis helps the company trace the origin of hardware components and verify that all parts are sourced from certified trustworthy suppliers. This minimizes the risk of counterfeit hardware entering the organization's infrastructure and ensures compliance with certification requirements. Why the other options are incorrect? B. A legally enforceable corporate acquisition policy. While helpful for setting procurement standards, a policy alone doesn't ensure that suppliers follow it or that hardware isn't counterfeit. C. A right to audit clause in vendor contracts and SOWs. This provides the ability to audit but is reactive and doesn't actively prevent counterfeit hardware unless audits are frequently executed and focused on authenticity. D. An in-depth penetration test of all suppliers and vendors. Penetration testing is used to find vulnerabilities in systems and networks, not to verify hardware authenticity or detect counterfeit components. Therefore, the correct answer is A. Which of the following provides the details about the terms of a test with a third-party penetration tester? The correct answer is A. Rules of engagement. The rules of engagement define the scope, boundaries, and conditions under which a third-party penetration test will be conducted. This includes what systems can be tested, what methods are allowed, the time frame, and how findings should be reported ensuring both parties understand and agree on the test parameters. Why the other options are incorrect? B. Supply chain analysis. This evaluates the origin and handling of components or services throughout the supply chain. It's unrelated to penetration testing agreements. C. Right to audit clause. This allows an organization to audit vendors or partners, but does not specify terms for a penetration test. D. Due diligence. Due diligence refers to the investigation process before entering into an agreement or transaction, is broader than and not specific to penetration testing terms. Therefore, the correct answer is A.